Reduction is an evolution. Evolution is that species change over time. If they're not stuck one way and they've been different in the past, they may be different in the future. And then natural selection tells us how that happens, that in nature, individuals of a species are all a little bit different from each other. There is a struggle for survival because there might be limited food or water or mates or living space, maybe predators. So there's a struggle to see which of those individuals are going to make it. The ones that can survive the best are those that happen to be born with the best traits, the traits that are, make it easiest for them to survive. And they survive. They reproduce and pass on those good characteristics to their offspring. And over time, that leads to all species being well adapted to their environment. It can lead to new species developing. And that's what natural selection is. We also talked about why the individuals of a species are all different from each other, why they vary. And that's because of sexual reproduction and mutations. All right. So let's talk about some examples of different types of natural selection and different examples. So you know what bird this is, right? It's a peacock, yes. Um, and a peacock is a type of bird. The, the general term is a, a peafowl. A peacock is a male peafowl. The female's called the pea hen. And so you ever seen them walking around? Like some, I think I've been to Utica Zoo, right? You've been there? Yeah. Are they still like walking around outside with peacocks? Kind of neat looking. And so obviously one of the most obvious features of a peacock is the, are those tail feathers. It is. That's a tail? Yeah, that's their tail feathers. All of these feathers. Can they fold them? Uh, yeah, they can sort of tuck them in. This is, is this the male or female? That's the male, that's the peacock. This is a pea hen. She does not have, females do not have those huge, bright, colorful tails. Why do you think the males only have them? Okay. For like, like, like protection, like, I, I know the word, but I just can't think that's, of it. That's an idea, but it's not so much for protection, I have a, yeah, for impressing the females. It's used in mating. It's used to attract mates. That um, female, we call them peahens, is what their actual name is. They choose their mate. So a peahen will choose a peacock to mate with, but they choose them based on their tails, okay? based on um, sort of the coloring and the size of their tails. And so, um, the way that this results in the species changing over time sometimes it takes a while. Um, the more impressive the tail of the peacock, the higher its chance of reproducing, of mating. It's going on here. So female peacocks, the peahens, they choose their mates based on the color of their feathers. And the more impressive the male's tail is, the higher its chance of finding a mate. And so because the females choose males with the brightest tails, what happens to the ones that have kind of boring color or small little tails? Goodbye. Olivia? Um, well, it's not so much that they die, because they can survive. The tail doesn't really help them fly or anything. It doesn't help them get food. So it's not so much that they can't survive, but it's the next part of natural selection. Right? Yeah, they'll be lonely. What's that? They'll be lonely. They'll be lonely, and they therefore, because they're so lonely, they will not reproduce. They have no mate. They're going to go through their whole life alone because no females will choose them because of their because of their tails. So they don't reproduce and therefore 
They don't pass on those genes, those traits for these small tails to their offspring. But the males with super bright tails that are very showy, they attract the females, they can mate and reproduce more often, leading to, over a period of time, the species evolving to have bright, brighter and brighter tails. So, I, I mean, they could, they might be able to defend their young or their nest, but I'm not quite sure about that. I thought they used that for scary. This is a, um, a type of natural selection. It actually has a, um, its own name, and it's very common. It's called sexual selection, in which it's not so much that once one individual doesn't survive better than the other, but that one type, one variation reproduces more often. And you often will find this in um, lots of species that the males are often brightly colored. Uh, like birds, if you think about birds, um, you know what a male or duck looks like? The male male or duck, it's like a green head and a red stripe. Do you know what a female male or duck looks like? It's kind of brown and, and um, not colorful at all. So in many species, you see that the males are showy in color to help attract mates, whereas the females are often sort of drab or, or bland in color to help them blend in because they're often caring for the young, incubating eggs. So it's a benefit for the females to be camouflaged. It's a benefit for the males to be brightly colored. Philip? Is that like the, the skyline? Yeah, the main. Probably, I, I don't know if that's related to meaning, but it could be, it's a good question. So in summary, natural selection, any variety, any variation, any characteristic that's selected for, that's helpful in some way to survival or to reproduction, will become more common, will become abundance. And any variation selected against that's harmful or decreases survival or decreases reproduction, will become rare or eventually extinct. We've talked about this before that, if you think about eggs, a, a fish can lay hundreds of thousands of eggs at one spawn. They cannot all possibly survive. It's just, there's, there'll be too many. Many of them are eaten. Many of them don't get fertilized, they may not grow from their young stages. Which ones are most likely to survive? The ones that are Which one? The ones that are, yeah, are best suited to their environment. It might be that they blend in a little bit better, and so predators don't see them. It may be that the membrane around them is a little tougher and they're more durable. Who knows? There could be lots of variations that are helpful. Whoa. What the heck? What is that? Um, um, I don't know if that video works. I guess it was that. Um, it's a cartoon depiction of Miss Dark Harry, but I'll show you. Uh, hey, it looks like a I'll show you uh, the video at it once yeah, we go with our notes. It's, it's a, just a little illustration of natural selection. It looks like a raindrop. You remember about Darwin on his travels around the world on the Beagle? He stopped in one place with the Galapagos Islands, which are just off the coast of South America. It's a series of small little islands. And one of the things that Darwin took note of in his journeys in the Galapagos Islands are the finches. Finches are small little birds. He noticed that the finches all were pretty similar in the, their body, but they were different in their beak. These are some of the finches that Darwin saw. And again, the shape of their head is all pretty much the same, but they all have different beaks. And those different beaks, he noticed, match the foods that those finches ate. All of these finches, eventually, they all evolved from one common ancestor, a finch that moved into these islands. But as these finch lived on these separate islands, they started to take different paths through evolution, depending on which island they were on. Because different islands had different food sources for these finches. Okay? So they all evolved from one finch, 
but they all evolved different beaks due to the pressures on each other. I don't have that word. You got to type that in. They both had evolved different beaks. And this was an example of natural selection. For example, some islands had an abundance of fruit on them. And the finches that have moved on to this island, their beaks eventually evolved to look like this, to be sharper, to cut through that fruit. Other finches lived on islands where there were these large, thick seeds, like sunflower seeds. And they had a pretty big outer shell that had to be broken to eat the seed inside. Those finches evolved to have thicker, stronger beaks, because that was an advantage. Some had smaller beaks. They didn't need to break into large, thick hulled seeds. Some ate insects, some ate larger insects, some even eat cactus. But each of these types of finches evolved a little bit differently. And again, that's because there were different conditions on each island. Some islands it was an advantage to have a thicker beak, and some islands it was an advantage to have a thinner beak. It sort of depended on each individual environment. So each of these finches had evolved a different beak due to the different pressures on the island. And that's something Darwin saw, something that allowed him to come up with his ideas about natural selection. Was thinking about, well, why are these finches all pretty much the same, but they have different beaks? How did that happen? Um, another example that you might not think about, but that I think we probably have heard of, antibiotics and pesticides. What is an antibiotic? Antibiotics. It's a pill that you take. What does it do? You know what antibiotics do, Rania? It helps get rid of the, um, like a sickness or virus inside your body. Um, close. It does help to get rid of an illness, but antibiotics are only used to get rid of an illness caused by what? Bugs? Not bugs. That's a pesticide. We'll talk about that in a minute, Lily. Bacteria. Antibiotics are medications which help to kill bacteria. Bacteria can cause different diseases, ear infection, um, strep throat, different diseases like that. What is a pesticide, Nick? It's a, a chemical that kills an insect, a pest, a bug. You might use them in a garden or on a farm to kill insects that would be eating crops. So. How many people have had strep throat before or an ear infection and had to take an antibiotic? I, I would I guess that. I had an ear infection when I was a baby. Yeah. So, so you know, if you have, let's say I have a sore throat, go to the doctor, they take a culture, you know, they put that Q tip thing in your yeah, throat. Yeah, I know, that felt weird. Yeah. They culture it and they say, okay, yes, you have strep throat. What they're saying is the reason you have a sore throat is there's a certain type of bacteria called streptococcus bacteria Never that's in your throat. It's growing, there's a, a population of them in there. It's causing your throat to become red and inflamed and sore and hurt. So they may give you an antibiotic to take, a <coughs> pill or a liquid that you take. Hold on. And so let's say I have that, I have strep throat. I go to the doctor, they give me amoxicillin, that pink, Liquid, you know, they say it tastes like bubble gum, but it tastes horrible. Oh, no. So they give me that. And so I take it today and tomorrow. And then tomorrow night and the next morning, I start to feel better. My, my sore throat doesn't hurt anymore. Are you supposed to then stop taking your medicine? No. no. Okay, what do they tell you you have to do if you're taking an antibiotic? Bailey? Yeah, you have to take it for a certain number. You have to take all of it. Even though I felt better after three days, I'm supposed to take all of the medication for 10 full days usually. Why do they, why do they tell us to do that? So I feel better. Why should I be taking this medicine? 
The actual reason is because of natural selection. Vinny? Well, maybe because uh, you might feel better, but the virus isn't like completely gone. The bacteria? And it can probably come back. Okay, good. You're correct. If you think about natural selection again, when I take these antibiotics, these uh, chemicals go into my blood, eventually make their way to my throat, and they start to kill the bacteria that are causing my sore throat. Which ones of those bacteria die first? What do you think, Lily? Yeah, the sort of weaker ones that were not too strong. And so I take it our day, it kills the weak ones, the really weak ones. I take it for another day, it's killing more of them, the ones that are still pretty weak. Take it another day, now the ones that are medium strong have died off. And maybe most of the bacteria have been killed. And so I feel better. Most of the bacteria are gone from my throat. But what if I stop taking it? What is then going to happen? Eddie? It's going to get worse. Yeah, the one, which ones were left in my throat after three or four days? The strong ones. The ones that happen to be the strongest out of the bacteria in my throat. Can those reproduce? So they can survive even after four or five days with this antibiotic. And if they can survive, they might be able to reproduce. reproduce. Mm -hmm. And so if I stop taking my antibiotic, what's going to happen to those bacteria? They're going to reproduce. They're going to reproduce. And my infection is going to come back. But this time, it's going to be worse because most of them are the stronger bacteria. And so my sore throat's gonna come back. Now when I start taking, I say, oh, it's hurting again. I better take my amoxicillin a couple more days. But now, maybe it doesn't work so well because the bacteria that are left are the stronger ones. And I may have to go back to the doctor and get a different antibiotic. And this happens, and we, this is called antibiotic resistance. And the reason they tell you to take all of it is because if you take all 10 days, even the strongest of those bacteria are probably not going to be able to survive 10 days of being exposed to these medicines. So by taking it all, you ensure you kill all of the bacteria and that infection doesn't come back. So really it's related to natural selection. It's instead of nature selecting which bacteria survive, it's the medicine. And if you don't take it for the full, full time, the infection can come back worse. The same is true of pesticides chemicals that we spray on fields and farms and gardens. When we start spraying, they kill most of the insects. But then once we stop, the ones that survive might be the stronger ones, the ones that happen to be a little bit resistant to the pesticide. And then if we stop spraying, those can then reproduce, leading to a pesticide resistant type of insect. A common adaptation that many species have evolved, camouflage. Camouflage helps a species to blend in. Yeah, you don't have this exact slide. No. I just want to talk show you some cool pictures. No. Um, and so, why might it be good for a species to blend in with its environment? Okay? So they won't be caught by Okay, so it can avoid predators, they can't see it. What else? There's other reasons why it might, might want to blend in. Faith? Um, so, like, so that it can get food and like, maybe the food like, won't see it coming. Yeah, so it can sort of sneak up on its prey. Correct. Well, Lots of different species can uh, have developed camouflage. This is a flounder, you can't really see it very well. Its pattern on its scales matches the gravel in the bottom of the ocean very, very well. These are ibexes. These are deer-like creatures. They live in uh, the Middle East. Do you see any? Yeah. So they live in this sort of dry, rocky uh, environment. Here's one. Yeah. Here's a little one. Yeah. Facing towards the camera. Here's one. Did you see that one? No, not at all. So they're pretty t hard to see because they develop camouflage. And again, this camouflage has come about due to natural selection. Maybe they weren't always that color. Maybe they're a different color. But the ones that happen to be born with a variation in their fur color that lets them blend in a little bit, survive better, reproduce more. And over time, they all have developed that camouflage.
These are the Pepperin moths. This is what we're going to be learning about in our lab tomorrow. The story about the Pepperin moths. Let me go to the next slide. Oh, no. So the Pepperin moths, there's two varieties of Pepperin moths. They're all one species. Some are lighter in color, like this one. Some are darker in color, like this one. The story behind the pepper moths is in England, during the time of the Industrial Revolution, do you know what that is? What is the Industrial Revolution? Billy? Isn't that like after a war they fixed everything? Mm, not so much. Like electrical was invented? Yeah, when industry started to become invented, burning coal and, um, pow and um, factories started to become widespread using something other than like water power, using burning fossil fuels. And what happened is before the Industrial Revolution, the trees in these areas were light in color. They had lichen growing on them. So you see there's two moths here. Here's a light colored moth, here's a dark colored moth. The dark one was pretty rare because predators could see it easily against the white tree background. The lighter colored ones were more common. But after the Industrial Revolution, soot and smoke and pollution started to collect on the trees. It killed the lichen. It made the trees darker. And what people saw was that over time, what do you think happened to the lighter version? Right yeah, the number of lighter colored moths decreased. What happened to the number of darker colored moths? Increased. Yeah, it increased. This species of moth had evolved to be more darker moths than lighter moths. Because of the change in conditions, the darker ones blend, blended in better. This is a catadid. It's an insect. Its body looks exactly like a leaf. This yeah, it is does. Its body. It just looks like it grew legs. Or a Even cats what? are camouflaged. What the heck? You what? see a cat there? A cat? Oh, yes, no, I did. Yes, I did. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. No. Who says they see it? Who claims they see it? Nobody? I can see it, and I don't even have glasses. Where is it, Betty? Right there. Oh. Up. A little to the, no, 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 no. There, almost, yeah, tiny. No. Yes, right. No. Nope. No. Nope. Oh, I thought, oh. Oh, what? Wait a minute, I think I'm. Oh, is there one laying down right there? Nope, that's the only one. What? What? It was, that was so blended in. I know. All right, here's another view of the pepper moths. See, on the light background, before the Industrial Revolution, you can hardly see that pepper moth that blends in soil. You can see the dark one. We look at the other one, the dark one now. After the trees became darker, now the light one stands out more. Or is more likely to be eaten. The dark one Everyone? OK. Um, the last thing is mimicry is interesting. Mimicry is when a species evolves to sort of copy the look of another species. Mimicry, it mimics another species. And sometimes it mimics another species to attract prey, sometimes to discourage predators. I'll show you some examples of this. Do you know what kind of snake that is? Corn. Uh, uh, black, yellow, and red snake. It's a coral snake. You're close. This is a deadly snake. Ooh. It's very venomous. can kill you if it bites you. This is the scarlet king snake. It is not at all poisonous. Two different species. But this scarlet king snake, so why does the coral snake why is it so brightly colored? Wouldn't that be bad? Because predators could see it very easily? Faith? Um, no, it, the bright colors are usually fatal. Yeah, the bright colors are a signal to predators to avoid eating this. That's what okay. Why do you think this scarlet king, it's not poisonous. Why did it evolve to have these very bright, similar colors? Brennan? Well, it doesn't hide. It still like stands out because it's yellow and red. Vinny? Like maybe it's darker because, um, like, because it has like more 
have a chance hiding from the other one? No, it doesn't hide. It stands out. Yeah. Faith? Um, it mimics it so that it can, so that other people, other animals think that it's the deadly snake. Yeah. That it's poisonous. Exactly. Predators confuse it with the coral snake because they have a similar pattern, and therefore they won't eat it. Even though it's not poisonous, they will avoid it. Really? They actually don't have the exact same pattern. Did I even know the same? Elisa? Red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. Red touches black, you're a pink cat. Yep. Red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. Red touches black, you're okay, Jack. So in the king snake, the red is next to the black. In the coral snake, the red is next to the yellow. So that's one way to tell them apart. I'm still killing. It's another example. You know what type of butterfly this is? Monarch. That's a monarch butterfly. They are poisonous to predators. Monarch. Okay, they eat milkweed and they incorporate some of the chemicals from the milkweed into their bodies, making them poisonous. This is not a monarch butterfly. This is a viceroy butterfly. It is not at all poisonous, but it has evolved over time to mimic the monarch. Again, because predators, most birds know, don't eat the monarch. It's poisonous. They also will avoid the viceroy butterfly because it has a similar pattern. This is a bee orchid. Okay, It's a flower. Its petals have evolved over time to be fuzzy and brownish in color so that they look like a bee. They mimic a bee. Now in this case, it's not, it has nothing to do with poison. Bees think that the orchid flowers are female bees and attempt to mate with them. In the process, they get pollen on them and then they pollinate the uh, other orchids. So it's a way of attracting bees is by mimicking a female bee on the petals. How is that good for the plant? Because it helps pollinate the plant. Plants need pollinators to fertilize them. I thought the plant was going to eat the bees. Many things mimic leaves because they blend in in the forest. This is, I think it's a willow tree. This is the insect holding onto the branch. You can see its body looks identical to one of these leaves. It does. Again, same thing. This is an insect. It's not a leaf. You can see its head. You can see these are its, its limbs. Is, is it under it or is it? No, that's the body of it. That just looks like a covered up bug. I know. Another cat here. I get that. Those are weird. Yeah. It just looks like a Again, yeah, this is a uh, mimic. Th a lot of things mimic like seaweed and leaves in the ocean. There's another. Coral? That's pretty cool. I like There's a fish and mimics that seaweed. Frog, toad. <laughs> another fish. So just lots of different examples of things mimicking other species to help in some way. Okay. Um, yeah, that is just an awesome idea. When I was at your grandpa's, there he had this glass door, and there was a stick bug on it. Oh, yeah. And it was really cool. I was like, I yeah. wonder why it was there, because it doesn't really blend in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was in Costa Rica, I saw some walking sticks. Mm -hmm. They're huge insects. They look yeah. just like a twig. Mm -hmm. All right, our last, last idea here to talk about. So remember, we, when we say natural selection, survival of the fittest, well, the question is sometimes, well, what does it mean if an organism is fit? Look at some mice here. We have four different mice, black mice, tan mice, mixed black and tan, and then cream mice, and some information about them. How fast they run, how many babies they have, how long they live. Which of these is the most fit, would you say, in this environment. Yeah. Bailey? The tan. Yeah, the tan one. It lives the longest, has the most babies. E is it the fastest? No. no, but that's okay because it lives the longest and it produces the most offspring. And we know that's what it means to be fit, to successful. Now, let's think about some lions. If I have some lions here, four lions, George, Lucky, Spot, and Slick. Which of these lions would you say is the most fit? And why? So which is the most fit and why? Eddie, what do you think? Lucky because he's the oldest one. No. Lucky does live the longest. You're right. <coughs> does that mean he's necessarily the most fit? No. Lily, what do you think? Well, he um, has the most like, baby lions. 
Who does? As a mo he did father the most cubs. Maybe that makes him more fed. Faith, you have another idea? Slip. Why slip? Okay. So which of these lions is most likely for their genes to make it into the next generation? Slip. Slip. He didn't live the longest. He didn't have the most cubs. But out of the cubs that he fathered, 19 made it into adulthood so that they can reproduce. More than any of the other lions. So yeah, probably he's the most fed. And last thing. Giraffes did not always have such long necks. They used to be shorter neck giraffes. How then, today, do giraffes have such long necks? Tell me about how natural selection resulted in that. Eddie? Did they Well, give me some more information, some more details here. Vinny? Like maybe on um, like when they reproduced like the father was bigger and the mother could have been smaller and then when those kids were born they were bigger and then it kept going on and on. Okay, you're getting there. What's the benefit of a long neck? Nick? Changing. But how is that helpful? Because the Yeah, helpful to get food. And that giraffes feed in the trees. The giraffes that were born with longer necks were able to reach more food. If they could reach more food, what could they do better? Survive. Survive. And then, then uh, after they survive, reproduce. reproduce. When they have offspring, what are their offspring probably like? Longer necks. Right. Now, the important thing is nobody said it, which I'm happy. What do people sometimes think happened to giraffes to result in giraffes having long necks? Olivia? That they like stretch their necks and then they got longer and then they'd offspring and their necks were longer. But it's not that they stretch. Can one, this giraffe adapt and all of a sudden have a longer neck? No. no. He's born with a short neck. He dies with a short neck. They can't adapt. An individual cannot adapt but the whole group over time can. Eventually, all giraffes had long necks because it was an advantage. And those that happened to be born with it survived and reproduced. Better.